Well, please, congregation, turn your Bibles in the first place this afternoon to Psalm 91. We'll look at a couple passages together. The first from Psalm 91, and the second from Revelation chapter 12, in connection with our ongoing study of the doctrines set forth in our confession of faith. You'll recall from last time that we started to consider the doctrine of creation. But last time we gave our attention especially to God's creation of the visible, physical world. And so this afternoon we direct our attention to God's creation of the invisible, the spiritual world, namely that of the angels and their many hosts. So first of all, Psalm 91, this is God's holy word. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's turn also to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, this too is God's holy word. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that, he might, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. And they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth, and see. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had, who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. 
the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help, to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river and the great dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. There ends the reading of God's holy word. Let's also turn to Article 12 of our Confession of Faith, Article 12, page 164 in our Forms and Prayers books. We dealt especially with the first three paragraphs last time, and then I'll deal with the second three this afternoon, but we'll start at the, uh, the beginning of the article. We believe that the Father created heaven and earth and all other creatures from nothing when it seemed good to Him by His Word, that is to say, by His Son. He has given all creatures their being, form, and appearance, and their various functions for serving their Creator. Even now, He also sustains and governs them all according to His eternal providence, and by his infinite power, that they may serve man, in order that man may serve God. He has also created the angels good, that they might be his messengers and serve his elect. Some of them have fallen from the excellence in which God created them into eternal perdition, and the others have persisted and remained in their original state by the grace of God. The devils and evil spirits are so corrupt that they are enemies of God and of everything good, they lie in wait for the church and every member of it like thieves, with all their power to destroy and spoil everything by their deceptions. So then by their own wickedness they are condemned to everlasting damnation, daily awaiting their torments. For that reason we detest the error of the Sadducees who deny that there are spirits and angels, and also the error of the Manichaeans who say that devils originated by themselves being evil by nature without having been corrupted. This the church of our Lord Jesus Christ does believe and confess throughout the world. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, do me recall that we began our study of the doctrine of creation last time by asking ourselves the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what then are the righteous to do? And as we sought to answer that question from the Word of God, we considered some of the various ways in which the foundations are indeed being destroyed in our society and world. If we live in a world as in such enmity against God that it denies the existence of God altogether. And so, men and women, we heard, have become gods to themselves. And so I said that in that sermon, just by way of illustration, that we now live in a world that that says, for example, men can be women and, and women can be men. And we live in a world where same-sex unions are so normalized and promoted that, that whoever would dare to suggest otherwise is, well, just a prude and, and a bigot. And so we, as, as the little church living in, in the big world, find ourselves, don't we, in this constant and real struggle between standing for the truth of God's Word against all the, the lies of the world, now as we come to the latter portion of Article 12 of our Confession, we're reminded that this struggle in which we find ourselves is simply the outer workings of an even greater struggle, the, the struggle behind the struggle, which is also being waged even now between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. Revelation 12 gives us a a window into that struggle. There we read about the, the great red dragon who is Satan trying to, to devour the woman who is the church of Jesus Christ. John tells us how he saw Satan's tail sweep down a, a third of the stars of heaven, expressive language for Satan's attack on, on the good order of God's creation. And John tells us how even after the, the woman fled into the wilderness to that place, Prepared for her by God, a great war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. There is a struggle behind the struggle. There is a struggle that's going on, not only in this, 
visible world, which we can see with our eyes, but also in the invisible, which we cannot see with our eyes. You may recall back from our series of the book of Daniel how, how in the 10th chapter of his prophecy, God gave Daniel also a, a window into that greater struggle. There in that chapter, we read about how Daniel was was mourning for three weeks, mourning over the, the state of the church and, and distraught about the future of, of the people of Israel. And he says, in the, year, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for three weeks. But then you may recall what happened on the 24th day of the month as he was standing by the riverbank, Daniel lifted up his eyes to heaven and he saw a figure like that of a man clothed in linen. His face had the appearing of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, and the sound of his words was like the sound of a great multitude. His appearance was so overwhelming that a great trembling fell upon Daniel so that his companions fled for their lives. And even Daniel, we read, lost all his strength. When he heard the, the voice of this heavenly being, Daniel fell with his face to the ground. He was totally overwhelmed by his sense of utter unworthiness before the holiness of this heavenly being. But that messenger, you may recall, had not been sent by God to frighten Daniel, but rather to comfort Daniel. And behold, Daniel tells us, a hand touched me and, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And from there, the angel went on to, to explain how Daniel's prayers had not gone unheard. Daniel had not been put on hold. But rather, the angel explains how his coming was delayed for 21 days on account of the fact that, that he had been in battle with, with the prince of Persia, that, that evil spirit behind the prince of Persia. Until finally the archangel Michael came to help him. You see, behind the visible struggle that Daniel could see with his eyes, the, the distress of the church, his, his concerns about the future of the church, so few going back to Jerusalem... Behind all that, there was a spiritual struggle that was also going on behind the scenes. Our chief adversary, you see, is not just some earthly power. He's not just some fleshly obstacle we have to overcome. But as Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We confess in the Nicene Creed that our God is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. And he calls us to be mindful of that this evening. Granted, I am sure that most of us probably don't think very much about the invisible realm. And even when we do, those thoughts are, are perhaps often sparked by things we see on TV or, or in the movies. Good and bad angels standing on, on one's shoulders or talks about the various superstitions known in the world. And there are no doubt a whole host of, of unbiblical ideas concerning the, the invisible spiritual realm. And if there's one thing all the, the reformers were agreed upon, it was that, that we must be careful that we not unduly give ourselves to speculation about many matters which God has left unknown to us. For we, says one pastor, cannot probe the invisible realm and bridge this chasm but the Word of God does do that for us to some extent. And as we study the Word of God concerning these matters, we are actually greatly encouraged to, to look to the Lord all the more, to pray to Him and to rest in the knowledge that there is indeed Christian victory and Christian triumph, not only in the struggle that we can see, but also in that greater struggle that we cannot see. The struggle behind the struggle, as Revelation 12 so powerfully reveals to us, for as the psalmist says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Which is to say that those who abide in God don't need to live in fear of the enemy, be he visible or invisible. 
because the Lord is their refuge and their fortress, their God in whom they trust. And so while we, of course, recognize there is a great deal that we do not know about the angels, what we do know for sure is that God commands them concerning us. They are His messengers, faithful servants whom He created to serve His elect. And so understanding concerning angels begins with with that basic confession in the first place that they are indeed His created angels. They are fashioned by, by God. They are His heavenly creatures. As our confession says, we believe that the Father created heaven and earth and all other creatures from nothing. And we believe that it is God who gave to each creature its being and form and appearance as well as its function in order that all things might serve Him in His glory. And this, of course, includes also the angels, as we confessed here in Article 12. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, He also created this heavenly host of angels. Each angelic being was, was fashioned by God to serve God. And as Genesis 1 tells, when God had finished all His created work, He saw that it was all very good. And so we detest the error of of the Sadducees, who we discover in Acts 23, denied that there were spirits and angels. And we also detest the error of the Manichaeans, whose error was to say that devils originated in themselves, and they were evil by nature without having been corrupted. Yes, there is a struggle going on behind the struggle, and demons are real. Evil spirits are real. We have to recognize that contrary to what the Manichaeans would have said, this struggle is not an eternal struggle, but it's a struggle that began in in real time with a real fall when when some of God's heavenly creatures rebelled against Him and, and corrupted themselves, Satan and his hosts. We have to remember at all times that Satan and his hosts are indeed just that. They are They are only God's creatures. They did not originate in and of themselves. It's not as though there was an eternal struggle of of good and evil, yin and yang. But all things were created good and were good until, until the rebellion. And then there was evil. And the point is just that we recognize that that unlike God's eternal goodness, evil has a beginning. And unlike God's eternal goodness, evil also has a definitive end. For no creature, no matter how powerful it may be, is more powerful than the God who created it. Angels, whether good or bad, are just creatures created by God to serve God and to bless God. That was their original purpose. And so he Sing those words in Psalm 103. Bless him, ye angels, wondrous in might. Bless him, ye servants, who in his will delight. We could have sung also in Psalm 148, where the psalmist says, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels, praise proclaim. To quote John Calvin, since the angels are God's ministers, ordained to carry out his commands, there should be no question that they are also His creatures. Colossians 1 tells us that Christ is the creator of all things. For by Him, says Paul, all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And those are indeed just a few of the angelic designations that Scripture reveals to us. Because God is, is pleased to administer His authority in, in the world through them, says Calvin, angels are referred to here as principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions. In addition to those, there are also, we know, the more well-known cherubim who, who guarded the entry into paradise and, and who gazed upon the mercy seat in the Old Testament temple and who especially reveal God's majesty and power and glory. In addition to the the cherubim, there are also the seraphim mentioned, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6, who who stand always around the heavenly throne of God and and sing His praises, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. 
They too are God's creatures. The Bible reveals to us that they are not only creatures, but like humans, they are also spiritual, rational, and moral. Both good and evil angels are endowed with intellect and will. In some cases, they know even more than we do. And like us, they are moral by nature. They, they know right from wrong. And yet the angels in other respects are, of course, radically different from humans as well. For example, as, as glorious as angels are, only humans are made in the image of God. To quote Herman Bovink, angels may be mightier spirits, but humans are still the richer of the two. And in intellect and power, angels may far surpass humans, but in virtue of the marvelously rich relationships in which humans stand to God, the world and humanity, humans, are psychologically deeper and mentally richer. Consequently, he writes, the richest and most glorious attributes of God are noble and enjoyable not only, to, not only by Sorry, consequently, the richest and most glorious attributes of God are noble only to humans. Although angels experience God's power, wisdom, goodness, holiness, and majesty, the depths of God's compassions are only disclosed to humans. Isn't that something to think about this evening? That as glorious and, and as powerful as the angels may be, they are not the apple of God's eye. And, and as faithful as the angels may be in their service to God, they, they are not God's prized possession. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we are. That's what we've become. Unlike we who, who fell in Adam, the angels who fell with Satan have, have no chance of redemption. For as the author of Hebrews tells us, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise partook of the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but Christ helps the offspring of Abraham. The angels are glorious, heavenly creatures for sure. Even now, they, they stand before the throne of God and they worship God and, and give Him glory. And yet, congregation, God takes more delight in you than He does in those glorious angels. The angels, First Peter 1 tells us, actually long to see the things that we've come to see in the Lord Jesus Christ. As to their number, we of course cannot be sure, but when the Bible speaks of the angels, it indicates that they are clearly constituting a great army. The words the Bible employs when speaking of the angels are words like hosts and, and myriads. When the apostle John was given a window to heaven, as we heard in our call to worship, what did he say? Then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. And so despite what our secular world would have us to think, these heavenly creatures are indeed every bit as real as we are. They are God's heavenly creatures fashioned by God, assigned their functions by God, God's heavenly creatures. We're concerned in the second place tonight, though, why did God create them? When our confession gives us the Bible's answer, He created angels good that they might be his messengers and serve his elect. We see this all throughout the Bible, don't we? Many angels, by, by God's grace, have indeed remained there in their original state, as the Belgian Confession says. And so, how often aren't God's faithful angels employed in, in the service of the story of salvation? The angels were there already after the fall, guarding the garden to remind our first parents that, that the Christ must come for communion to be restored. And at some of the key points in the history of our salvation, we, we see that the angels were employed by God to, to make that salvation known. It was an angel who, who appeared to Zechariah in the temple saying, 
Behold, your wife Elizabeth, barren after all these years, she will give birth to a son, and he will make ready for the Lord a people prepared for Christ. It was an angel who appeared to Mother Mary. So the shadow of the Almighty shall overcome you, shall overpower you, and you shall conceive and give birth to a son, the Lord Jesus Christ. At the time of our Lord's birth, it was an angel who appeared to the shepherds watching their flocks by night and who said, Behold, I bring to you good news and of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It was angels who declared to the women that Christ had raised from the dead. It was angels who explained to the disciples that Christ's ascension, that Christ was surely coming again. And so the Bible shows us that it is their chief aim to bring glory to God by serving His elect. And so they went into the heart of those pagan cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot and his family and to warn them of the coming destruction. When Elisha's servant in 2 Kings 6 was filled with fear at the sight of the, Assyrian, of the Syrian army. And when he said, Alas, my master, what are we to do? How did Elisha respond? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open the eyes of my servant so that he may see. And the Lord did just that. He opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. An army of angels was protecting them. It was an angel who, who comforted Daniel, as I said earlier on, who, who gave him strength to stand on his own two feet, who, who declared to Daniel that, that there was a greater struggle going on, but that, that God was, was winning that struggle. And so it was also in the days of Jesus. Matthew, for example, tells that after Jesus withstood the temptations of, of Satan in the wilderness, the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And so it was also at the end of his earthly ministry that as our Lord prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but, but thy will be done. Luke says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And by the Spirit of Christ, the psalmist says to the church of Christ, he says to you and to me, that God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Commenting on this verse, John Calvin writes, this is added by the psalmist expressly with the view of removing any fears which might arise from our infirmity. God in this psalm, you see, is, is bending over backwards as it were to show us that in this great struggle between the kingdom of light and, and the kingdom of darkness, we don't need to be afraid at all. In verse 2, the psalmist describes God as being like a fortress all around us. In verse 4, he describes God as, as being like a mother hen whose, whose wings overshadow us and keep us safe as they did the woman in Revelation 12. In verses 5 to 10, he describes God as being like a shield all around us, protecting us from, from arrows and plagues. But when even all these attempts to encourage us have been tried, says Calvin, and when God finds that we still linger and hesitate to approach Him and cast ourselves upon Him, He next makes mention of the angels and holds them forth as guardians of our safety. As an additional illustration of his indulgent mercy and compassion for our weaknesses, says Calvin, God represents those whom he has ready for our defense as being a numerous host. He does not assign just one solitary angel to each saint as some talk about and describe guardian angels, but God commissions, says Calvin, the whole armies of heaven to keep watch over each and every individual believer. The angel says, the author of Hebrews are indeed ministering spirits sent out by God to, to minister to those 
who are to inherit salvation. They are God's messengers of good news. In Luke 15, we, we discover that they rejoice in heaven even when one sinner repents of his sins and looks to Christ in repentance and faith. such as the ministry of the faithful angels who are indeed God's holy servants. But what about the fallen angels? What shall we say about them? Well, the fallen angels, as we've already heard, are also created by God. They were at one time good and part of His good creation. But in sin, they rebelled against God and became His hostile enemies. As our confession says, some of God's angels have fallen from the excellence in which God created them into eternal perdition. Not much is said in the Bible about the nature or the manner of their fall, but the sixth verse of Jude tells us that, that they chose to, to leave their proper dwelling. 2 Peter 2.4 says that God did not spare those angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. In contrast to the faithful angels, we know that the fallen angels, they love to take for themselves what only belongs to God. Whereas the, the faithful angels say, do not worship us, worship God alone, as in Revelation 22, verse 9. The fallen angels do just the opposite. They seek their own glory. And we see the audacity of that, don't we, in the temptation of our Lord, as Satan says, I'll give you the kingdom of earth if, if you'll bow down to me. Can you imagine the audacity of that? A creature saying to the Christ, to his creator, bow down and worship me. But most of what the Bible does tell us about these fallen angels is said in order that we might always be on guard against them. For the devils and evil spirits are so corrupt, says our confession, that they are enemies of God and of everything good. They lie in wait for the church and every member of it like thieves with all their power to destroy and spoil everything by their deceptions. In Revelation 12, Satan is referred to as, as the deceiver of the whole world, the accuser of the brothers. For being in constant revolt against God, writes Louis Burkhoff, they seek to blind and mislead even the elect and to encourage sinners in their evil. And this is why the Apostle Peter warns us, saying, be sober-minded, be vigilant. For your chief adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, says the Apostle Peter. This is why the Apostle Paul likewise tells us in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. We might withstand those fiery darts of the evil one those constant and never-ending temptations to, to give in to sin. The fallen angels hate God, and they hate the church of God, and so their chief aim and ambition is to destroy and to poison the apple of God's eye. And so the demonic is certainly not something to make light of or to toy around with. We do well to, to take to heart what John writes in Revelation 12, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Then the dragon became furious, verse 17, with the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and, and hold the testimony of Jesus. Yes, we need to be sober-minded and vigilant against that chief adversary, the devil. We must also not be given over to fear. For these fallen angels are, at the end of the day, only creatures. And they too, like all creatures, are under God's power. As we see, for example, in Job chapters 1 and 2, Satan himself can do nothing unless God permits him to do it. Again, writes Louis Burakoff, they are lost and hopeless spirits. They are even now chained to hell in pits of darkness. And although they are not yet limited to one place, they drag their chains with them wherever they go. Even Satan himself knows that his time is short. For the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. 
And so our confession says, by their own wickedness, they are condemned to everlasting damnation, daily awaiting their torments. And so while Satan and his forces do continue to pose a real threat in the world, we can still sing with Martin Luther, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. And we also take heart in knowing what John has said in his first epistle, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Satan, our great adversary, the accuser of the brothers, has already been thrown down. He's no longer able to do what he, what he did in Zechariah chapter 3. You may remember that as, as Joshua the high priest stood before the angel of the Lord, the Lord Christ, in his filthy garments and Satan standing there to, to accuse him. To say, look how filthy this man is. How can he be of service in your kingdom? He can't do that anymore. The accuser of the brothers has been thrown down. In Luke 10, 18, we read that Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In Matthew 12, 29, we read that Jesus has bound the strong man and plundered his house. So in our vigilance against Satan, we must never think of him as being more powerful than he actually is because he has nowhere near the power that God has. Satan isn't all-knowing. Satan isn't all-present. Satan isn't all-powerful. And that's why James can write to us, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist him, and he will flee from you. Because greater is he who is in you, Christ by his spirit, than he who is in the world. The days of these fallen angels are numbered, and their ultimate defeat is sure. In Revelation chapter 20, John goes on to describe how he saw Satan being thrown down into that lake of fire to be tormented forever. His doom is sure. And then, of course, the same destination for all those who do not know God, who do not place their trust in God, they too will face that just wrath of God. But such will never be said of us. For he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And until that great and awesome day, God says, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample under your feet. You will trample him under your feet. He who testifies to all these things says, Surely I am coming soon. And so we pray with all the confidence in the world, even so, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are indeed a great and glorious God. That glory is seen in all that you have made, not only in the earth below, but also in the heavens above. Lord, we confess there's much we do not know or quite understand about the angelic host, but we do know this much, that you command them concerning us to guard us in all our ways. We thank you, O God, that you are so willing to condescend to us to to go out of your way, as it were, to make us see. We have no reason to be afraid in this life, not of enemies we can see or enemies we cannot see. We thank you, God, that the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. And that although he's not limited to one place, he drags his chains with him because his doom is sure. Father, we pray that Christ would indeed come, and he would come quickly. That our world, which you made good, would finally be rid of evil. And that we who dwell in the shadow of the Almighty might see the face of our Savior, the great King and conqueror of our enemies. 
We pray that he would come soon, Lord, that he would come tonight. That we would finally be free from all the evils and and temptations of this world and see him and be with him forever. But if he tarries, Lord, grant us sobriety of mind to be vigilant and to be mindful that Satan prowls about like a roaring lion. Give us grace, Lord, to resist him and to do so in the confidence that he will flee from us. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.